And indeed, he was the cheapest. It was a discount and it was $25. Now, if you're in Ghana, convert that to CDs. My Ugandans, convert that to UG shillings. <laughs> You'll see that these skills that we look down yeah. on back home, yeah. they're very important here. Hello, welcome back to Lean TV. Today, we have a special guest who will be joining us to talk about the incredible benefits of being an international student here in Canada. Whether you are considering studying abroad or just curious about the experience, then this episode is for you. Please join me in welcoming my pastor who goes by the name Philippa. Hello, Pastor Philippa. Welcome to Lean TV. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Finally, I get to be on Lane TV. <laughs> okay, Pastor Philippa, I have you here to talk about the benefit of being an international student here in Canada. Let's go. So first of all, I would like you to introduce yourself to my viewers. Awesome. So my name is Philippa. I'm originally from Uganda. I moved to Canada in 2010. So yes, that was about 13 and a half years. In September, it will be 14 years. I moved originally to Nova Scotia, Halifax, Nova Scotia, went to school there for six years, and then now I am here in Regina, Saskatchewan. So I probably have a little bit of insight in regards to being a student in Canada and what life can look like after that. Thank you very much. What motivated me? Funnily enough, it was my parents. So I was one of those, I watched TV a lot. I had a boyfriend in school. I was like, it is love, we're going to get married. Spoiler alert, we did not get married. But I did not want to leave the country, but my parents just were determined that they wanted a better life for their, for their daughter. And school was one of the avenues that they could use. And so they decided, they did the research they found this university called Dalhousie University. It had the course that I had been talking about doing. They did the paperwork, the application for the visa, for school, everything. By your parents? Yes. And then they let me know it was not a choice. I was going, whether I liked it or not. Okay. And I ended up in Canada. Sounds good. Yeah. Yes. So you, the interesting thing about the Canadian system, I, you know, I can't speak for any other Western system, but the Canadian system is that I have found that at least in post-secondary education, so that is everything from first year university up, they seem like they're genuinely interested in you learning how to learn, yeah. right? They're interested in you applying yourself. So you'll find many students, especially those of you who maybe you went to school back home for university and then you moved here. The number one thing that I hear people talking about is the amount of work that they get to you to do. Yeah. The, the amount of assignments, the amount of tests, the amount of all these different things. But it's because the Canadian system is designed to teach you how to learn to teach you to apply yourself, to teach you to have critical thinking, to teach you how to be reflective, to teach you how to be observant. Why? The system is designed that those skills are required for you to be able to excel in any jobs that are not your minimum wage jobs. You know, so anything aside from maybe working in a restaurant and even to a certain extent some of those areas to be honest you need some of those skills and so the system is designed to give you those skills so that by the time you graduate from your bachelor's or your master's you may not necessarily use the knowledge like the literal information that you learn in school you know one plus one equals two x squared is this but they're skills that you have been forced to learn in order to graduate that prepare you for the real world. So that's one of the big things that I have found going to school in Canada versus going home. You know, back home you hear things of professors who hail themselves because yeah. the highest grade is a 75. Yeah. Here, <laughs> if your students are failing, the, is, you have a problem. Yeah. And it can actually affect, as a professor, it can affect your chances of becoming full-time. So you see what they're doing is they want to push professors 
to teach so that the students can actually learn and live with something that benefits them. So that's one of the things that I have found is unique about the quality of education here in Canada. That's good. So to be honest, right now, Canada is what you'd call saturated when it comes to international students, right? I'm sure many of you heard about the new caps that the Canadian government is putting on how many students they're bringing in. And so you find um, when it comes to work, there are many people that are fighting for the same opportunities. Yeah. Because when you're an international student, especially your first year, your first semester, you, there's a high chance that you haven't come with a lot of work experience. So your resume might be a little bit lean on work experience, or even if you have work experience, it's not necessarily Canadian experience. And so you're coming in, you're competing with the people that are in second year, third year, fourth year as international students. You're also competing with students here because a big thing that people tend to do here is you finish high school, you take a gap year. Yeah or two gap years and you just work, which means you're also competing for the same kind of jobs with people that are from here, yeah. right? However, that doesn't mean that it's not possible for you to get work. It just means that you're going to have to be persistent. Number one, you're going to need to learn how to sell yourself. And the only way that you're going to be able to sell yourself is if you, are, if you know who you are, you know your strengths, you're able to show up and be present because one thing that I've noticed is in Africa well I'll speak for you and okay. you confirm if it's the same in Ghana yeah you we have a culture that encourages people to sort of keep calm right like if you if you have a very big presence it's like oh you're showing off or yeah. whatever and so there's a less chance of you getting that kind of job yeah whereas when you come here when they see something like that they see someone who's maybe unsure you're incompetent, right? And so they'll pass you and go to someone who is more assertive. And so you find now, even right from the get-go, when you go to drop off your resume, how, what's your presence? How are you interacting with the managers? Are you being quiet? Are you being timid? All those things will deter them from even looking at your resume over all the other people that are there. But if you bring that to the table, then you find that you probably have a better chance and as far as what the specific job opportunities are, most of it is going to be, say, things like retail, so stores, um, restaurants, um, construction work, casual work. Um, if you come, a lot of master's students tend to come with experience from before. So maybe let's say you were an accountant before, you know how to do bookkeeping. All those kind of things can help you to gain to gain access into those other job opportunities many people right now are trying to get into the healthcare sector because during covid there was a shortage but the truth is there was a shortage they brought many people in foreign workers and all of this so now that area is also saturated yeah something that i encourage people to do that many people don't think about doing is small businesses because if you come and you're starting a small business, you're fulfilling a need that's present, you find that you don't have to rely on the job market. You know, right now, a lot of jobs, especially for students, they're, you're not contract. Sorry, rather you're not full time. Yeah. So you find maybe it's a two week contract, three week contract. So you're always on the edge. Am I going to have a job next week? Am I going to be able to pay? So being able to get a skill, if you're home, Learn how to cut hair. Learn how to do hair, like braid hair if you're a girl. Learn how to do nails. Learn how to sew. Learn how to clean. You know, all these are things that it's so expensive to get those services here. Because at home, maybe we look down on those kind of skills, those kind of services, because you can just pay someone very cheap to fix your shoe, to do yeah. this, to do that. But here, time is money. Yeah. They don't go. They, they go based on time. So how 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 long did it spend? To, how long did you spend to do this hourly and all those things? And those kind of skills they pay. Someone was a student was recently telling me how they wanted to fix their zip, just the zip, 
and the person was going to charge them $25. Yeah. No, $25 for, for the me? task. And it was something that was going to take them maybe like five minutes. <laughs> and the and she was like, ah. And he said, you know what? Go try and see if you'll find a price cheaper than that. And then we'll talk. And indeed, he was the cheapest. It was a discount. And it was $25. Now, if you're in Ghana, convert that to CDs. My Ugandans, convert that to UG shillings. <laughs> you'll see that these skills that we look down yeah. on back home, yeah. they're very important here. And something that is easy to start up. You don't need much money to begin it. Yeah. I would really recommend that for every student. Think about a skill, learn a skill back home, come be a solution to a problem, and you'll find that it will actually pay your way through school. So the postgraduate work permit, one of the most coveted things for people coming to move to Canada through yeah. the route of school. <laughs> it is a work permit that you automatically get once you finish school in Canada, if you have gone to a designated learning institution and if you have completed a, a course that is longer than eight months, I believe. So if you're coming for a short course, three months, four months, you, you don't qualify to get this. Also, if you are going to, I think they call them private partnerships. These are maybe private colleges that part, are partnering with a designated learning institution to offer some of their school. Before you used to be able to qualify to get the postgraduate work permit, now you don't. So it's very important that you look for a designated learning institution. Yeah. Now, how the postgraduate work permit works is the amount, the length of study that you did in Canada will equate to the length of the permit that you're given if you're in undergrad. If you are in your master's as of December, okay. I think December 2023, they changed it. Yeah. So I'm going to touch on the um, undergraduate side because that's the most stringent side. Yeah. If you come to school for an eight month program, you will get an eight month work permit. If you come to school for a two month, two year work program, you will get a two year work permit. I believe once you do, or at least when I was in school, three years and above, you would get a three year work permit. So for example, if I did a four year bachelor's, I would still get three years. Seems um two years, I was getting three years now. Okay, so maybe they've changed it. So yeah. they've changed it from what it used to be when I went to school. And what the purpose of the postgraduate work permit is, is to give you time to find a job, work, become eligible for permanent residence, and apply for permanent residence. That is what the purpose of that permit is. Because what they want in Canada is once you've gone to, gone to school in Canada and you've graduated, they, it's in Canada's best interest that you stay here and you work and you become a permanent resident. So that's the incentive for the postgraduate work permit. The important thing to note is you can only apply for it once and you cannot renew it. So if you, let's say you want to do two programs, I'll give you an example. In my case, I came to school for architecture. Architecture in Canada, you have to do an undergrad and you have to do a master's. The undergrad is four years, the master's is two years. At the end of the four years, I had the option of stopping my, you know, graduating from the bachelor's, applying for the postgraduate work permit, working, getting PR, which is permanent residence, and then going back to do the master's and get my full architecture um, license. In my case, I didn't end up doing that because a lot of people, when they take a break in school, it's hard for them to go back. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you just have to think if you're in a program, maybe you want to do medicine or something like that. It's probably a better idea for you to come do maybe a two year diploma break, apply for your postgraduate work permit, work a job, get your permanent residence. Yeah then go back to school now as a permanent resident, cheaper fees because you're not paying the international differential fee, and then you go on, right? So it just depends on what your resources are. 
But the big thing to note is once you graduate and you apply for that postgraduate work permit, you cannot apply for it again and you cannot extend it, which means there are people who come and their goal is I'm going to do a one year diploma, graduate from the one year diploma, apply for the postgraduate work permit. I would say that's very dangerous because one year diploma is going to equal one year postgraduate work yeah. permit. You may not get the job right away. And with a lot of provinces, um, minus Saskatchewan, and I think there might be maybe one Beta, or two other ones. Better in Halifax. Uh -huh. Aside from those ones, other provinces, you have to work for a year. So if you're going through the Canadian Ex Express entry, you have to work for a year. Then you apply to the PR. Then if your points are the right number, they invite you okay so you see right away if you're just giving yourself one year you're playing with fire <laughs> so I encourage people if it's a money issue at the very least do a one and a half year program so that you have that leeway of the six months the other thing that you can do is once you graduate from school put in your application online do not drive to any border to do it because if you drive to the border you'll get your postgraduate work permit right away yep. which means they start counting your one year from that day if you apply online then as soon as you put in the application you have assumed status yeah because that's something that canada does as soon as you have the application and they have it you can uh, you act as if you have the status until they give you a final decision but when they're giving you the one year they'll count it not from that right time when you put it in so it gives you it will give you maybe you know two so. weeks it gives you a bit more leeway like so that's what jobs. i exactly yeah. so that's what i would encourage people to do apply for it online and try to do school for at least a year and a half if you can two years but i know financially that may not always be easy so at least a year and a half the other thing is you know people think that it's based on so if you were in, in Canada for two years, maybe you maybe it's a two-year program or a one-year program, but you're doing it bit by bit, you know, three courses yeah, yeah. every semester, so it takes you two years, two to, do years to do it. That doesn't matter. As far as CIC is concerned, the program was meant to take a year, so they consider it a year of school. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Awesome. Yes. Number one, and this might be a controversial take. If you do not have the funds for the first semester, actually, I won't even say first semester. If you don't have the funds for the first year of school, whether it's your parents, whether you've saved for it, if you're a mature student and all of that, I would highly discourage coming to Canada. Reason being, your first semester is a huge learning curve right um new environment new school new this new that new curriculum new way of teaching new impression of you exactly and if you're coming without those funds it means that you're going to have so much pressure to try and find work like your focus won't be on adjusting to school your focus is going to be on finding work and so what many students find is they come, they're so focused on finding work and then they fail their first semester. What does that mean? That means that you're already incurring more money that you're going to need to spend to redo those classes. And if you came with, let's say, let's say you applied for a two year program and you got a two year work permit, sorry, two year study permit for a two year program. If you have to redo classes, you're going to have to apply for a permit extension, which is more money. So you, you realize that you're starting off setting yourself up for failure. Exactly. So I would encourage that if you, own, if you can only afford for one semester plus upkeep, then I would say come in the winter semester. Is it going to be hard to adjust? Yes, because temperatures are cold. You know, you're going to have to get your winter gear and all of these things. And I know many of you will say, oh, I'll buy my winter stuff back home. To be honest, what you buy back home will not be winter yeah. appropriate. Yeah. I would say maybe they are 50, uh, 20 degrees jackets. They are not even up to zero degrees. Exactly. So, but if you can only afford your first semester, come in the winter semester. Why? You will 
not have to work for that first semester you'll adjust you'll do all these different things maybe towards the end of the semester you start looking for work then you'll hit your summer semester summer is not compulsory for school in canada so it will allow you to do that then now you can continue i know many agents advise people come in the summer you can work it is very dangerous very why because you're not allowed to start work legally yeah. Yeah. until you have started school yeah. which do, do many students do it yes but I can promise you right now the Canadian government is shifting and scrutinizing international students, scrutinizing immigration, scrutinizing all these different things. Many of you say, oh, how will they know that I was working? The honest truth is in Canada, systems are connected. Yeah. When you apply for school, you get your work permit, you get a UCI number. Yeah. When you come here and you apply for your social insurance number, which is what you need to work legally, they ask you for your work permit. They'll get your UCI number and connect it to your SIN number, which is the social insurance number, which means anytime you are paid properly by a legitimate company, those records are there. Now, does CIC always talk to CRA, which is the Canada Revenue Authority? No, but they, if they need to, it's very easy for them to just request and the information goes there. So you don't want to come, spend all this money, spend all these resources, adjust to a new place only for you to apply for permanent residence and you get denied you don't want to have to go through that is the grace of god available yes is the mercy of god available yes but you can't demand mercy yeah. so you can't do the wrong thing and they say god you must be merciful towards me no god is merciful towards what he decided to show mercy to yeah. yes so that was my number one thing was come with either a year worth of tuition and upkeep if you're coming in the summer or if you can only afford the one semester, come in the winter. That would be the first thing. The second thing would be if you're home and you're not yet coming here, try to find work back home. Why? You'll have things to put onto your resume and that will help you. Number four, watch Canadian news. Why do I say news? It will it will get your ears accustomed to the accent. It will get your ears accustomed to the vocabulary. You notice I say news, not movies. Because movies, um, social media can be very informal. But news, they'll be very formal. And that is probably how your professors will be talking. So it will help you get adjusted before time. Um, what other advice would I have? reach out to people if you know people that are here because they can help you especially if you know people that are going to be in the place that you're going to the city that you're going to be going to they can help you have a softer landing yeah. maybe you can crash with them for a week or so they can look into apartments for you yeah. ask them real honest conversations and questions rather because they can tell you the cost of living real things that if you're using say an agent they won't tell you yeah. because the agent just wants you they want the money, they want the money. Yeah. You know, so talk talk to people. Sign up for Lane TV. Follow him on Instagram. Follow him on TikTok because he has so many tips. He shows so many things. He does stuff like this. I promise you, there's information out there if you just look for it and apply yourself. You cannot go wrong with more information. So yeah, that would be my advice. Thank you very much. Up. As we conclude today's discussion, it is evident that being an international student here in Canada offers a world of opportunities and experiences. Mm -hmm. From all class education to studying and working at the same time, um, post-graduation work permits, language skills and network. I can say these benefits are truly remarkable. We hope that from Philippe's insights, you've gained some valuable information on what it is like to be an international student here in Canada. Thank you, Pastor Philippa, for joining us and sharing your experiences and insights. And thanks to the subscribers for tuning in. And if you're not a subscriber yet, what are you waiting for? Just press that button you see there, subscribe. Press it. I promise your life will change. Till next time, take care and keep exploring. Bye. Bye.